All right. Let's start chapter eight. So chapter eight introduces us to definitions. And it's kind of weird to have a discussion about definitions before you know what definitions are, because then we can't define what a definition is. <laughs> we have to go through kind of a little bit of an obscure process to get to it, to get to what exactly we mean by definition. So uh, the author starts out by talking a little bit about some of the history of definitions. The first thing he does is introduces you to uh, the Aristotelian way of defining something. And the way that Aristotle would do it, if you wanted to define a species, what he would do is first uh, state the genus it was part of. Now, he just had genus and species. He didn't have the big classification system that we have today. Uh, so he would give the genus, and then he would give the species, and not the species, in defining the species, he would give the genus, and then he would give uh, what he would call the essence of the thing. So for example, the common one given is, uh, man is a rational animal. The essence of man is they're rational. That's what makes you different from every other animal. But then you are also an animal. So that's how he would define man. Make sense? The four traditional roles used in a more broad sense are these. So the first traditional role is gives the essence, which is leaning towards the exact idea that Aristotle was trying to capture. But then we have these other restrictions on. So number two, it's not a circular definition. Now, you know circular definitions when they're circular right on their face, right? If I were to say, what's good, it's having the property of goodness or something like that. And you understand right out the door, no, that's circular, that doesn't work. But circular can also be in a string of definitions. So I say, what's a hill? And this is literally from uh, Webster's Dictionary. What's a hill? A usually rounded natural elevation of land lower than a mountain. Okay, what's a mountain? A land mass that projects conspicuously above its surrounding and is higher than a hill. Right? Doesn't work. Something's got to get. Now that's how our definitions are in English. Every word is defined in terms of words. But you can see when you're building up a theory, that doesn't work. I can't use these words to then define these words to then define these words to then define these words. It's I'm going to eventually make a circle where I have to have undefined terms. Does that make sense what I'm saying? And so you're used to working with undefined terms. When we were building up our system for arithmetic, those axioms we were talking about last time, we had a bunch of undefined terms. We had zero in there, we had one in there, we had plus in there, we had multiply in there. These things in our system that we were building up, they weren't defined. Now, does that mean that they're meaningless? No, the axioms are how you give them their meaning. But their meaning isn't acquired through a definition. Another example is like in geometry. You don't define what a point is, you don't define what a line is, but you have an axiom that says every line has at least two points. So the axioms give you relation, give you information about those terms, but those terms are ultimately undefined. And the other thing to keep in mind is when we do introduce a definition, remember that that's treated just like a premise. Well, kind of jumping ahead of myself here. Let's finish these and we'll go back to that conversation. So, can't be circular. Number three, stated in the positive. What that means is you're saying what it is, not what it isn't. What's a house? It's a building that's not a school. That's what a house is. No, that doesn't work. Force is not a kinematical notion. No, that doesn't tell me what force is. You state what it is if you can. You don't state it in the negative. You state it in the positive. Make sense what I was trying to say? Yeah. And then the fourth rule, it can't be figurative or obscure language, obviously. Beauty is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror. What? <laughs> that literally says nothing. That gives us no information about anything. Right? So, none of this nonsense. It's poetic. It sure sounds nice. Right? Because it's so obscure that you think, you know, if I were just smart enough, maybe this would make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. That's why it doesn't work as a definition. All right. Uh, okay, so these, these are the traditional rules for definition that uh, people on a high level have to follow, but we'll see real quick that these restrictions, unsurprisingly, aren't good enough for creating definitions in math and logic. And we'll see an example right out the door. 
Let's say I define some new symbol, and I define it such that x circle y equals z if and only if x is less than z and y is less than z. Okay? You understand this definition? Now, does this break any of these rules? No. 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 You know exactly what it's saying. It's very clear, stated in the positive. You know exactly what this is supposed to mean. But notice what happens. Using this definition, then 3 is equal to 1 circle 2, because 1 is less than 3 and 2 is less than 3. Mm -hmm. And 1 circle 2 is also equal to 100. Because 100, because 1 is less than 100, 2 is less than 100. Do you see how I can get this from using this definition twice? Mm -hmm. And so you get 3 is equal to 100. Well, we know that's not true. We broke something. So when we're coming up with our rules for how we have to define things, and keep in mind, what are the things that we need to define in our system of math? We need to be able to define new relations. We, we need to be able to define new operations. And we need to be able to define new constants. Mm -hmm. Right. And then everything else follows from those. So as we develop the rules for those, we're basically uh, thinking really quick, what, what are the things you got to watch out for in building these rules to make sure you don't do something bad? And what's the bad thing about what this let us do? This let us prove something that we know isn't true. So when we're building up our rules, we need two things to happen. One, it needs to be eliminable. I shouldn't have to use that new word. I should be able to use uh, just the terms and the expressions that we already have in our system. So for example, when we were talking about subtraction, I never had to use subtraction. Let's say we define subtraction as plus a negative. I would never have to use an actual minus sign. I could just use plus a negative number. And I could always just use that instead. So how, whatever you use to define your new symbol, you should be able to get rid of your new symbol and go back to your old way. You can go back to what you already know before you create that definition. Before you create, exactly. So it needs to be eliminable. You have to be able to get rid of your new symbol and That's, your system still makes sense. Does that go just back to undefined terms eventually? With those undefined terms, you can define this thing? Ultimately, you're, so, so the constants and the terms captured in your axioms we call primitives. Okay? So the ones that just show up in your axioms we call primitives. Your first definition has to be completely in terms of primitive symbols. The only symbols that can use are primitives. Your second definition can use your first definition and primitives, etc. Make sense? Yeah. Those aren't helpful. So it has to be eliminable and it can't be constructive, meaning my definition can't allow me to prove something that I couldn't otherwise prove. Oh, yeah. Right? I couldn't prove this just from uh, the axioms on uh, the number that we were looking at last time, the axioms of arithmetic, but I couldn't prove 3 is equal to 100. But if I then you allow me to define this system, I can now prove 3 is equal to 100. So if I allow this to be a definition with those axioms we were using last time, this allows me to prove something that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to prove. Make sense? Okay. So those are the two things that you kind of, those are our two criterions, our two criteria for uh, developing our definitions in a high sense. Now we'll go over exactly what the criteria are. Okay? Okay. So let's start with the criteria for eliminability. A formula S introducing a new symbol of a theory satisfies the limitability if and only if whenever S1 is a formula in which the new symbol occurs, then there is a formula S2 in which the new symbol does not occur, such that S1 and S2 are logically equivalent. Remember, this one has a new symbol. This one doesn't. But S1 and S2 are logically equivalent. They say the same thing. It is derivable from S and your axioms and preceding definitions. Mm -hmm. Okay. You with me? So S is how we define our, S is something like this. Here's S. It's just a formula. It's a, it introduces a new symbol. Mm -hmm. So S would be this. Let me label it here. 
So with this example, S is up here, and then right here we have S1 logically equivalent to S2, right here. So here's an example using it. Let's go over that criteria one more time to see how this satisfies it. A formula S, that's right here, introducing a new symbol, we're introducing the minus sign, introducing a new symbol of a theory satisfies a limitability if and only if. Whenever S1, this formula over here, is a formula that, in which the new symbol occurs, then there is a formula, S2, such that S1 is logically equivalent to S2, is derivable from S, S our definition, and our preceding definitions and, their ax and the axioms of the theory that we're developing. That's what this is saying. It's said a little bit different, right? It's saying all our axioms implies S implies S1 is logically equivalent to S2. Right. Well, axioms but, and definitions. Right. Axioms, definitions, all our premises implies this implies this. But remember, that's the exact same thing as this and this implies S1. So I think this is a better way to think about it. This is kind of a weird way to think about it. Why? Why is that a weird way? All your previous, uh, all your previous premises imply that your new definition implies that these two things are logically equivalent. Is a weirder way, in my mind, than all your previous uh, premises and that definition implies those two things. But, I mean, I, I assume that the author did this way because he thought that that made more sense, so. But those are logically equivalent, and I prefer to think about it at the bottom line. But it doesn't matter how you think about it. Logically equivalent ways of thinking about it. So, we all feel comfortable with the criterion of eliminability? Yes. And we see how the, how our definition for the minus sign satisfies it. Anywhere, any expression that has a minus sign in it, we could always rewrite it in terms without the minus, right? Okay, now the criterion of non-creativity. Here I'm gonna show you an example of where it didn't satisfy that and it enabled us to create more things. So this is gonna be a bad one that doesn't help us. So the formula S introducing a new symbol of the theory satisfies non-creativity if and only if there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur, such that our definition implies that new formula is derivable from the axioms and the preceding definitions of the theory, but T alone itself isn't. So, back to over here, here's where it was bad. So, let's look at this one and see how this doesn't satisfy, okay? So, a formula S introducing a new symbol Here's our formula S introducing the new symbol circle. Okay. Right? Because we already had less than in our definition last time. So a formula S introducing a new symbol circle. A new symbol of the theory circle satisfies non creativity if and only if there is no formula T or 3 equal to 10 in which the new symbol does not occur. 3 equal to 10, the new symbol doesn't occur. So there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur such that this, together with all our preceding premises, implies this. S, together with everything else, implies T, but the premises alone did not imply T. The preceding axioms and definitions. So T, 3 equals 100, is not something that we could derive from our axioms on arithmetic. Mm -hmm. But with this formula S and our preceding axioms on arithmetic, we could derive this. So saying a formula like this can exist, some formula that you couldn't have derived without the definition. It's saying there's no new formula T that you can derive that previously you couldn't have. 
And they say that doesn't contain a new symbol because obviously anything you could have proved without the definition doesn't have the symbol. Does that make sense? Are we good with this? Or is it still fuzzy? Yeah, it's still fuzzy. It's still fuzzy. Okay. So, let's, I'll just write right here to the side and do this and then we write it out. A formula S introducing a new symbol, we're looking at S is equal to the formula, and I'll put quotations around where the formula starts. X circle Y is equal to Z if and only if X is less than Z and Y is less than Z. And we'll say that the theory we're dealing with is arithmetic that we were developing last time. Mm -hmm. Remember those 15 axioms? Roughly. Yeah. You remember that they had less than symbols in them, right? Uh -huh. And then and's a symbol of logic, so we can always use that. So notice over here, we never use a symbol that you didn't already know. This is a new symbol, circle. What does x circle y mean? You didn't know that before. Mm -hmm. Now this is telling you what it means. x circle y is equal to z if and only if x is less than z or y is less than z. And we're showing that this is a definition that does not satisfy this criteria. It breaks this criteria. It's going to allow us to do something bad. Mm -hmm. So, a formula S introducing a new symbol, circle, of the theory, arithmetic, satisfies non-creativity if and only if there is no formula T. So the formula T doesn't exist. We're going to show it does exist. We're going to show that the formula t, which is equal to, 3 is equal to 100. Don't get confused by my equal signs. t is 3 equals 100. Mm -hmm. So 3 equal to 100 is not something you could have derived from our axioms last time, right? Yeah. This is not a true statement based on those axioms. So you could not derive it from those axioms. So a formula T, something that you couldn't derive before, is what T represents. This is a specific example, but there's infinite formulas that could be. Right? Mm -hmm. So let's read this. So if there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur, notice T doesn't have that circle in there. So there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur such that S implies T is derivable from the axioms and the preceding definitions of the theory, but T alone isn't. So this alone is not derivable from the previous axioms. Mm -hmm. But if you let me have this as a definition, along with the preceding axioms, I can then prove this. Right? Yeah. Which is bad. Yeah. Right. So that's why this definition does not follow the criterion of non-creativity. Criterion of non-creativity is saying you shouldn't be able to prove something that you couldn't prove before. Here's something I couldn't prove before. With this definition, now I can prove this. Mm -hmm. So we're saying this breaks our rules for definition. We can't have a definition like this. It doesn't work in logic. We can't use these. Okay. So this criterion making sense now? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Oh, uh, just vocabulary. So the definiendum is the thing that we're defining. The definiends are the things that we define it in terms of. So when we're looking at this, here's the definiendum. It's the thing that contains the symbol we're defining. Here's the definiend. Okay. Just. Common vocabulary when you're talking about definitions. Just in case I actually say. Are all say definitions it. Uh, if and only if? No, they could be uh, equals as well. Oh. You can always define a definition in terms of if and only with the system that we set up, and you can sometimes define it in terms of just equals. Oh. An example of where it. You, can do it in terms of equals would be like uh, divides. When do I know an integer a divides an integer b? Have you seen this before? 
A divides B. Mm -hmm. A divides B if and only if there exists some integer C, some C in the integers, such that A times C is equal to B. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. 2 divides 8. How do I know that 2 divides 8? Because I know that there exists some integer, namely 4, such that 2 times 4 equals 8. 3 does not divide 8 because there is no integer c such that 3 times c equals 8. Another way to think about divides is it goes into it evenly, is common phrasing. Make sense? So here's an example if you couldn't just do an equals. Right. Exactly. You can always do it in terms of an if and only if. A lot of times you can do it in terms of an equal, like if we had a negative defined. We can say x minus y is equal to x plus negative y. And that's a perfectly valid way to define x minus y if we already have negative y defined. Right. So there are many definitions that can be stated with identity above. You can't do all of them. You can always use an if and only above. So. Common to do. Okay. So we talked about this, talked about this. You saw how this one was eliminable. Let's look at how we showed that this one does not satisfy non-creativity. So we're saying, let's assume that one is an axiom and that I try to introduce two as a definition for a constant E. E is a number such that X circle E gives you X. Now, this then becomes a theorem I can prove. If I have this axiom and this definition, I can now prove something like this. There exists a y such that for all x, x circle y equals x, mm -hmm. namely e. Mm -hmm. So this could be proved from these two, but not from this alone. How do we check for sure that this can't be proved from this alone? How do we show that this implies this is not a valid argument? Doesn't matter what steps you try to take in between. Going back to chapter counter four. Counter example. Counter example, you have the right idea. You could do a proof to show that it isn't. You would argue out of certain. Now you don't prove it. You do a counter example, and a counter example takes a interpretation. So you need to find the interpretation where this is true and this is false. Right. If you can do that, then this is not the logical implication of this. And we can do that. Let's take this. We'll define our domain to be the set containing 1. And we'll define circles to be plus. This is unsatisfied, right? Domain is what? Oh, we'll make it 1. We'll make it the positive integer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we'll make circle plus. Then this is satisfied. But this is not true. Right, because there's no zero. Because we got rid of zero. We just said our limits positive integers with plus. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. Right. So that's how we show. But then if we introduce this, then we're obviously introducing zero, and then this becomes true. So you. That's why it doesn't work because you have creativity, no. Well, that's proving that this is a creative definition if we let this be a definition. Yep. Because we just barely showed that you cannot get this from this alone, mm -hmm. but obviously you can get this from these two. Right. Therefore, this is this would be a creative definition if we let this be the definition for E. But isn't that like a definition? The definition of an identity element? Basically, is it that e defining e like that is the definition? You have to introduce as an axiom. And if you want something like this, it needs to be an axiom Not of your theory. Definition. Remember, that's one of the things where, you, well, once we get to it, then we'll realize your first definition can only be an 
in terms of your primitives. If we say that this is our only axiom and we try to make this a definition, E is not a primitive symbol. Hmm. Right, you right. can't put it in terms of your... There's no way for me to express E in terms of this. Yes. Right. Right. So it has to be an axiom to use it. Yeah, if you want this, this has to be an axiom. If all, another way to say it is axioms are always creative. It makes sense. We want axioms to always be creative. Right. If there was an axiom that wasn't creative, get rid of it. It adds nothing to your theory. Make right. it a theorem. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So, one weird thing. So, definitions, remember when you introduce a definition, that's just like introducing a new premise, right? They're just yeah. non creative premises. So your axioms are your premises that are creative. You know what theorems are. Those are the ther things that logically follow from your Absolutely. premises, and you can then introduce them as new premises and arguments. Mm -hmm. Then you have your definitions, which introduces new premises, but we don't want them to be constructive, like an axiom is constructive. But why did I anywhere in here require that my definitions be consistent with my theory? Why did I say a definition has to be consistent with your axioms? Why isn't that a third criterion? Do you understand why I'm asking? No. So we said a definition. Can you just can can you redefine consistent again? You can't prove a contradiction. It doesn't enable you to prove. So if I have premises one, two, and three, if I have premises one, two, and three, whatever they are. And I shall have these premises together lead to some sort of contradiction, some sort of, uh, whether you just a statement that's false and contradiction can't be true, then our premises are not consistent. And the definition is just a premise. Why don't I have a criterion for my definition needs to be consistent? Isn't that basically just a non creative theorem? Exactly. So if my definitions did imply something false, that, yeah, that's what that's A, you couldn't have proved this to begin with, and even if you want to say, well, that's not really something new, well, I could then use false implies and put any statement over here that I want, it's and it's true, because false implies anything is true. Right. So the criterion of non-creativity is already capturing the, it has to be consistent, I guess. Make sense? Okay. So in reality, they are consistent. It's just not technically a requirement. Yeah, we didn't have to make it a separate requirement in and of itself because this is already capturing it. Right. Okay, so let's get to the... Make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, 8.3, rules for a proper definition. How many more chapters do we have left? I think that there is 12 chapters in the book. So, four more, basically? Yeah, so we'll get through eight today. I mean, after All the we way. cover this next section, we're basically covered the gist of it. Yeah. And then... So we've only got, what, like, four more weeks of class? No. Uh, chapter 12, I think it is, is massive. What is chapter 12? Uh, I can't remember what it's titled. So, we finished definitions today, that's chapter 8. Oh, we're already done? No. No. Yes, We'll come up with, we still need to do the rules for a proper definition, then we need to do definitions, which use it, identities instead of logical implications, uh, conditional definitions, and then uh, his conversation about dividing by zero is just awful, so we'll just have our own conversation about that. But then chapter nine is when we start getting into sets, developing set theory, uh, that's a decent sized section. 
I don't know, it's not that big. Uh, hmm? Well, big relative to your own lens. It's 25 pages. Then we get when you do reading. that, is it just basically showing the notation? Because, like when we did that in the screen map, it kind of just got thrown into it and figured it out. And it wasn't that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. I mean, mm -hmm. set is what's underlying everything. It's the most basic thing you can talk about is sets <laughs> and set operations. It doesn't get more basic than that. Sound. Set operations like union and intersect? Yep, just like that. Basic stuff like that, and then we'll get into relations, just like you're used to relations, and then we'll get into functions, just like you're used to functions, and then we'll get into set theoretical foundations of the axiomatic method. Is that the what you were talking to us about a couple weeks ago, basically? That's the whole reason I wanted to do all this was leading up to building those foundations. Where this book ends is exactly what I want to get to. But it doesn't do it the way I hoped it did. And especially their development of set theory. I was really disappointed with that because he's, he says, rather than taking a rigorous approach, we're going to take an intuitive approach. And it builds the intuition rather than this using be rigorous. a rigorous book, though? Yeah, but his... Uh, excuse for doing so, and he says, other textbooks always go the other way, so he's going this way. The problem is, is now all textbooks do it, does it, all textbooks do it the way that he does it. This was a really old textbook, so at his time they were all doing it rigorously. He wanted to do it a different way to give you more variety, and now he gives us the same old crap that we get from the screen now. So are you, are you going to supplement it with a different? I don't, I don't have anything to supplement it with. You want you can't find anything. Well, I haven't specifically searched for that. Right. Uh, so are you going to end this book in? Uh, I don't know if we'll go through uh, 12.5. Uh, we'll get almost all the way to the end. We'll do probability, but I don't know about mechanics. Probability. Why, yeah. Why are we doing that in this course? So, 12, set theoretical foundations of the axiomatic method. He does introduction, set theoretical predicates, and axiomization of theories, isomorphism of a model for a theory, and then he gives two examples of developing a theory, probability and mechanics. Oh, so there's two examples. Yeah. So, probably do probability, not mechanics. What are, what's mechanics? Uh, physics. And just because we I feel the physics. It's probably going to be easier to do because we don't know trig. Oh. I don't know what exactly the mechanics would entail. Mm -hmm. I just know that whatever it is, it isn't something that I've been through. Maybe the probability is something different than what I'm thinking it is. I'm just thinking like probability, like probability and statistics, like right. sample space. Anyways, so yeah, starting at chapter 9, everything we're going over until 12. So chapter 9, 10, 11, it's all discrete math stuff with some stuff that we didn't cover, like partially ordered sets. Yeah, why did we skip those? Uh, that's the last section of the book. Or is it? Yeah. There was another section. There, there were a few sections we skipped. Yeah, we did skip some sections, but that's just because we don't have enough time to cover everything. Just try to choose. Just do that. Well, you can always just go through the book. You have it. So. Yeah. But I, I guess I could try and understand it. On my own. <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> you could do more than try. You it's could possible. succeed. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, for sure. There's so many resources available. I mean, for any specific thing you're getting stuck on, you could go Google it and find tons of different explanations of the exact same thing. On YouTube, the best I could find was discrete math, but the course basically ended halfway through our year. 
Yeah, you wouldn't want discrete math. You'd pick the particular topic that you're looking at right. and then go searching by that. Right. I mean, just Wikipedia a lot of times has helped me out a ton. Yeah. Surprisingly in depth for uh, math. Yeah, the problem is, is once you get in there, an hour later, you're gone through 27 different pages because you're like reading this page, and you're like, I'm not sure what this is. And then you I'm skip. not sure what this is. Yeah. This. Yeah. Not sure what this is. <laughs> it's like, okay, now we got this taken care of. I can go back and figure out what this exactly is talking about. So I can figure out what this is talking about. So I can. It's a bad hole. That's why we take classes. Why do you like appreciate this. authors so much? It's going to be a organized. Here's all the knowledge we're going to give you. Start to finish. Doesn't presuppose anything. It's just nice. Love a good textbook. But yeah, sometimes reading someone else's two cents helps a lot. Alright, so that's the high level stuff, now let's get into the rules for actual definitions and depending on what we're defining, it's going to have different rules, we're going to define new relation symbols, new term, or new operations, and then new terms, just as expected, right? Are we defining a relation symbol before a relation? Are we? I'm not understanding. We have uh, I don't understand what you just said because it sounded like you said the same thing twice. So we haven't, we haven't defined a relation yet. We haven't defined a relation in terms of set theory, what a relation is, but you understand a relation from a high level. We're saying that these things are somehow related. Yeah, but like, it's not a rigorous definition. It's not a rigorous definition of, I mean, true, because... Yeah, we can't define, we haven't been able to define anything yet. Yeah. We've just been, I mean, remember, that's one of the main reasons that we're going to this course. We're working our way from vague language to very precise actualization of mathematics. You have to start somewhere. Right, you have, you have to start with language, not just somewhere, you have to start with language. Right. That's exactly where you have to start. Okay, so... Equivalences, or relations, sorry. We're using equivalence to define relation. So an n place relation, which means it takes n variables, so taller than is a relation that takes two variables. Levi is taller than Donnie, took two terms. I shouldn't say variables, I should say terms. Well, we're gonna use variables in this, so yeah, I'll say that. So an n place relation symbol, P, which is logically equivalent to S, is defined if and only if it satisfies these three conditions. One, V1, V2, all the way to Vn, all have to be distinct variables. Two, S, so this is a definiendum, this is a definiens, right? So the theme that we already know, already understand, already uh, have defined, or is using primitive symbols, S has no free variables other than the things we're using to express the left-hand side, and then S only contains primitives or defined symbols. I guess I already said that. So, let's look at examples for that. Oh, I guess we had a conversation before that about A primitive formula or an atomic formula, sorry. No, we already had conversations about atomic formula, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Oh. Okay. That's what he's saying. He's saying notice that anytime we do a definition, the definiendum is going to be an atomic formula. So it's a relation. Well, what was an atomic formula? A predicate with the necessary number of terms. Right. So a relation is just a predicate with the necessary number of terms. And the predicate. In this S case can be is any formula, but this thing over here has to be. I don't know if it has to be, but all our definitions define it as a primitive. Not a primitive, an atomic formula. Make sense? Okay. What do you mean it doesn't have to be? 
said something about we're defining it as in town formula, but it doesn't have to be. All our definitions will have our definition them as an atomic formula. That's what I meant to say. I'm not sure if that's what I said. But not all definitions do that? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I, I was thinking, following this, it would be possible to create a definition that didn't do that. But then it's like you're trying to define two things at once. So you could just break it up into two definitions. Because I could have something like x is equal to, I could have something like x minus y and uh, a, a circle b. Now, I see what you're saying. Yeah, sorry. I'm making a mess of it, but I can say this and this using different variables, so I don't reuse x, y, and z, this and this, if and only if, this and this, just changing the variables. And so now it's like I'm defining two things at once. So with our definitions using a relation symbol, this is always going to be an atomic formula, just a predicate with uh, the necessary number of variables to go with it, the necessary number of terms. This thing over here obviously can be as convoluted as we want. Alright? Good? Okay. So that's what he's saying there. And so examples, an example of a relation. Oh, he starts saying, okay, let's let's look at uh, why we say each one of these things. So why do we require all the variables to be distinct variables? So the example is, let's say that we're trying to define x less than or equal to x if and only if x is less than x or x is equal to x. So notice we did a relation symbol and we used the same variable twice. Well, it does make sense. What are we really saying? We're defining the symbol means they're equal, right? Right. Yeah. Right? So he's, what he's saying is, yeah, you could put two. You could make like your variables that you're using aren't distinct. But then we could just redefine this as just a one-place operations, or one-place relation on x, if and only if x is less than x, which is always false, x is equal to x. We could just write it. So I could take this relation symbol, which uses two symbols, or which uses uh, the same term twice. In other words, x here, we have two variables, but they're not distinct. We use the same variable twice. Wait, distinct means it's only used once? Yeah, distinct means not, no two are the same. v1 is not v2, is not v3, etc. So here I had the same variable twice. So it's basically doing it. I mean, using the same notation as using up there, we could write less than or equal this way. I can say less than or equal, and we're going to pass in x and x. Right. Right? Here's the name of the relation. Up here, he calls it p. We call it less than or equal. It's taking x and x, the same thing twice. We're saying this is the case if and only if one of these two conditions are met. We can rewrite this capturing this exact same information more concise. in a more concise way where we aren't using distinct variables, or where we are using distinct variables. So having this extra variable here, it's like we're disguising what was really a one-place relation symbol as a two-place relation symbol. Make sense? So basically it's, it's a rule because it's a, it's a rule to encourage conciseness. Well, it's not encouraging conciseness. We lied when we said that we're defining an m place relation. This is not a two place relation, it's really a one place relation. Okay. Okay. So, this, if I define it this way, this is really not a binary relation, it's really a unary relation. So I lied when I said uh, two-place relation symbol, P taking two symbols, 
etc. Because it wasn't a two place, it was really only a one place. Right. So I wrote my definition wrong. That was not the right definition to use. Make sense? Uh, let's see, what's this example doing? Oh, uh, more stuff exactly like that. Okay, the second restriction, so let's see, S has no free variables. Okay, so the second restriction prevents definitions like... R of x, if and only if, x plus y is equal to zero. So we say R of x holds if and only if, x plus y equals zero. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense, and there's a good reason that doesn't make a lot of sense. Because we have a free variable in what we're trying to define over here. What do you mean by this y? Do you mean for all y? Do you mean there exists a y? We don't like the fact that this is free. We don't know how to interpret that. Yeah. So it's appealing to your intuition that, wait, what? Right? So... That's why we don't allow free variables to be in the right-hand side, other than the ones over here. They need to be down somehow. So we need like, there exists y, or for all y. We need to make this thing somehow sensible. Okay, da da da. Second restriction, da da da, we talked about that one. The third restriction. S only contains primitive or defined symbols. Oh yeah, that's what's preventing your circular definitions. You can't, because you can't use an undefined symbol. Right, so if I have S and I define it in terms of something that's not defined, T, and then I go and I define T in terms of S, then we get a circuit. so this is stopping our circular definitions. It's stopping things from defining hill in terms of mountains and the mountains in terms of hills. If I'm going to define hill this way, I need mountain already defined. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm going to define mountain this way, I need hill already defined. So that's what this one's restricting. Make sense there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So rule for defining an operation symbol. So when we're defining a n place operation, Symbol. What do we use for operation? Just a big O. So some operation symbol that takes n variables. We're used to typically binary operations like plus, multiply, divide, that kind of stuff. We also know some unary operations like negative. At some point, do we define operation more rigorously? Like in discrete math, we define we define relation pretty well. What? Is there, a, is there a definition for operation besides the kind of the intuitive one that you gave us? Yeah, an operation is a function. So it is a function. It is a function. We just haven't defined functions yet, that's why we don't. It's just, well, the operation, when, when we talk about an operation, we're talking about plugging terms into the function and getting something out. Mm -hmm. When we talk about a relation, we're talking about an order pair is in something. So when I say Levi is taller than Donnie, what am I saying? I'm saying that Levi Donnie is an ordered pair inside the taller than relation. Right. When I'm saying plus one and two, plus one and two, I'm actually passing those in as parameters into a function and getting the value out. Mm -hmm. So this is talking about something in our domain. This is just stating it's a member of something. So one's a statement. Your operation or your relations are always statements. You're saying this is what a member operation? of something. 
An operation is plugging something into a function and getting something in your domain map. Let's talk about a term in your domain. You guys taking the discrete math that will make more sense when we get there. <laughs> Sorry. Six. And actually, well, what, with what you talked to us already, that should actually make quite a bit of sense. Oh, we talked about relations in this class? No, not, not with the definition, but like that intuitively what it should make some sense. An operation is the statement. Like that makes sense. It makes sense that I said an ordered pair is a member of a relation. I didn't think it would make sense, but you'll learn my relations. It's a really simple one. Three reasons. It's just a set of ordered pairs. Literally. That's literally what it has. A set of ordered pairs. That's all it is. Okay. <laughs> you'll have a good uh, advantage over other people in our discrete math class for taking this class. It will definitely help. It's true. That's nice. Doing what you've done so far is like... I'm um, actually going to have a crazy good to speak math class. I'm yeah. not going to have anyone that I haven't taught. And everyone that you've taught means that they've well, taught a lot of this. Well, this is basically Aspen, and Rota. Yeah, it's, it's the these team. three and then Laura and Rota. So. For real? Allison, Tamara, none of yeah, those guys took it. They all took trig. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts my head. And it hurts your head? Yeah. About what? That they're being stupid. Well, it only helps you. It's true. The less people in the class, the more progress we can make, it, especially because we're going to have a really short school year. Oh, we yeah. only have 26 weeks. That is I don't see why it's a bad choice to take trip, though. Well, I hope you too don't blow me out of the water. Huh? So I don't see why it's a bad choice to take trip, though. It's not a bad choice to take trip. I mean, relative to all other academy classes, trip up here. You put them all on a spectrum. It's just a screen mask better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just take them both. That, that's why I would tell everyone. Take as many math and fundamental science courses as you can. The only reason I'm not taking trick is that I take calculus. Because they're at the same time. Uh, there's trick Wednesday and Thursday and Tuesday. Wow, called out. That wasn't on the schedule. What's on it now? What do you do Thursday morning? I have American history and I can't oh. drop that because it's a required class. Monday I have senior literature, which is a required class. What about Wednesday? Wednesday, I have personal finance, which is a required class. Yeah, seniors don't have any. We have two. We have two free classes, and they're both on Tuesdays. They're both on Tuesday. Tuesday. Sounds right. Yeah, that's uh, that's not great. Lily explained convocation to me. It's more. It's going to be so much fun. You think so? Levi says that. But yeah, I don't trust Levi. Yeah. It's going to be fun because we're going to take advantage of it and have a great year. We're going to encourage the school so much. Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> we're going to we'll see how much stress it puts on you I guys. We'll see how much courage it Hey, you stress, I've learned how to manage this amount of stress. You have, but how does your class? They don't. It's not that hard. <laughs> yeah. it's, not hard. <laughs> it's not that hard. You, know, you just think about it, you say, I accept so. this, it's the way that it is. And I'm gonna deal with it. <laughs> that makes it sound great. <laughs> it's like you, you can you can cry about it, but I mean, it's still there. <laughs> it's true. Is it just for seniors though? Or is it for the other kids too? You guys listen to all our encouraging words. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much difference between the way you're talking about that and like talking to a pregnant woman about having a baby. It's like, yeah, you can play about it, but what's gonna happen is gonna happen. <laughs> so maybe we'll just sit back and play it, right? <laughs> hey, like, all the terms said it was easy. Everything you're saying works in that description. And maybe it will be really, really rewarding when it's all said and done. Well, hey, that's a... <laughs> just saying how you're coming across. This is the analogies you're putting in my head. I know. Being stressed out sucks, but. I don't know. Huh? <laughs> All right. Equivalent. I realize I can't write exactly how this is. So when we're talking about a new equivalent, we're going to have a formula that equivalent. New equivalents. Operations. Operation. Thank you. So we're going to have some formula that introduces the operation, and it's going to be something to the effect of our operation with our variables v1, v2, dot dot dot, vn. So it's an n-place operation. 
And we're going to say it's equal to something. Remember, an operation spits out a term, something in your domain. I don't get what you mean by n place. There's n of them. You haven't seen that before? So it just goes on. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. We've only seen it in this class. That threw me no, off. I've seen it before in like algebra, but I wonder if it like means the same thing. Like it just means it goes on forever. Like it's just. It doesn't mean it goes on forever. It just means continues, right? pick a natural number. And um. Pick an actual number. Um, six. Six. So then if you pick six for n here, it means you list out six here. Oh, yeah. It's a way to talk about a generic count. Any number of terms. So if you want to talk about a one place operator, then you go from V1 all the way to V1. In this case, that would be just one. Because when I write something like this, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 up to n, I'm not saying it goes on forever. I'm saying up to some specified number. Okay. Goes up forever would be written like this. All right. So if I were to say the set of all numbers, 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 this would be all positive integers. This is some subset of that. This is finite, this is infinite. This has n elements, right. whatever n is, this yeah, has infinite right. elements. So yeah, we're saying some n number of variables want to pass in here. That's good. Bring up little things I write like that that you're not used to seeing. Because honestly, that's becoming one of the hardest parts about teaching, is trying to keep track of what you can and can't say and write. You should just always define everything in the initial question. You can't define everything. But you can define stuff like that. Right, but there's no natural reason in my brain to think students are going to get stuck on this. Hmm. I just, same reason you were content with it. You didn't think, oh, people haven't seen that before. No, no, no. I did think that. I just didn't say anything. Oh, you did think it? Well, I've seen it before. It's not a problem for me. Hmm? Well, if you think it's a problem for people, tell that to speak up. Can't have to worry about it in my calculus class because I have a. Bonnie Zidink, and I don't know who that she is. Took that, she took the class because every other class was full. That's the reason she's in calculus? She would like to transfer out if it's possible. She's in calculus because there's no other class that she could take. Um, that's not good. That's not good. She went to register and all the other classes were full. So she had to take calculus. That's oh, terrible. That class is gonna be a pain. Yeah. Because she knows. I've talked to her. I talked to her about it. Yeah. And she doesn't. She's not a very math person. She doesn't like math. Generally. Did she I think she's, trick? She, she failed the trick. Well, she can't be in the class. Well, he hasn't been taking it yet, so. I said I take people who either have passed discrete math or trick, oh. but they have to do one or the other. So she has a past trick. As far as I know, I don't, I'm pretty sure she failed it. <laughs> pretty are you sure? Uh, I will, it doesn't matter on the gradebook. The gradebook doesn't say, have you taken this or this, and then you learned this. You just register that's the just class. on the gradebook. Yeah, right, but right. it's the only class that she could register for. Well, I'll just have to let Polly know. Yeah, she can, she'll that, probably. That's not okay. She can probably transfer out, right? She has to. I mean, there's just no sense in doing it. She can't find the material. What's the point of having her sit there? Just to force her to fill a class because other ones were full? That's retarded. Had a chair. Right. Adding a person to a class isn't going to suddenly break a class. Okay. Define a new operation symbol. So when we define a new operation symbol and we're using the logical equivalence, we're going to have the operation operating on some terms is equal to some new term is logically equivalent to some formula. Right? And this is exactly how we defined the negative. Remember when we were doing, not the negative, the minus. When we were doing the minus, we were saying that x minus y is equal to z is logically equivalent to x equal to y plus z. Mm -hmm. Had some formula over here, 
We had some operation symbol applying to two terms, spitting out something else. Mm -hmm. Spitting out some term. It has to spit out some term. Okay. Otherwise, it's not an operator. Okay. So, so, so those three criteria also just apply to operation? Yeah. So this still applies, this still applies, this still applies. And then we have a fourth criteria, which is, so we still have one, two, three, and then we have a four, which is that there exists one and only one There is one and only one W such that S is true, is our fourth requirement. Okay. So, remember, W is what you get out of the operation symbol. Down here, our W was Z. So there needs to be one and only one Z such that X minus Y equals Z. Sorry. There needs to be one and one, only one Z such that X is equal to Y plus Z to make x minus y equal to z work as a definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you remember last time when we were doing our theorems, our theorem right before our definition of negative was something to that effect. Proving, right. we proved that there was one and only one z such that this is true. That one axiom gave us that there was a z. We said, assume that there's some other z prime that makes this true. And we showed that that led to z and z prime being the same thing. Remember that? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do we need to see that again real quick? No, we're good. No, no. We're good? Okay. So, that needs to be part of the definition, which makes sense. I need, when I do 1 plus 2, I need that to spit out one and only one number. Right. That needs to be able to spit out only one thing. When I do x minus y, when I do 7 minus 4, that better give me one and only one number. Because a term... When I have some term, 5 plus 3, this is just an encoding of a number. This is just 8 written a different way. It better be just a term written a different way. Make sense? So this has to be a unique thing. This is going to be our problem with uh, trying to divide by 0 when we get to that. We'll get there. Okay, so that's for defining an operation symbol, and then defining a constant. Just erase over here, start from right here. So when defining a new constant, C, we have to make a constant is equal to some term. W, and we can do that definition when when s when we have some formula that is logically equivalent to. So let's read it. So an equivalence introduces a new individual constant c. That's a proper definition if and only if that equivalence has the following restrictions. Did we go over proper definition? Definition, same thing. I haven't been saying proper. I've just been saying definition in terms of logic. So, uh, proper so the way I'd like to say it is, okay, we'll say that anything that satisfies these four general rules we had over here. Plus the two criteria. No, just satisfies the four, our traditional rules for a definition. Is a definition. Is a definition. And then you're going to say a proper definition. <laughs> or when you talk about definitions that we're actually going to use in logic and math. Oh, the criteria which actually use our criteria and follow these rules. So, he started saying proper, so you didn't get confused by definition, but you're smart enough to understand we're talking about definition and scope of logic. Yeah. We don't mean the same thing as when you're looking in a dictionary. We mean something much more strict. Right. And even a dictionary definition wasn't necessarily following those rules. But. Oh. I think some definition in a biology class. Definition in a biology class is not going to be near as strict as the definitions we require in this class, even though it might follow those four rules. Something like x circle y equals z if and only if 
x is less than y and x is less than z would be perfectly valid in a biology class. That's way more precise than something we require in a biology class, even though it leads to some unforeseen logical implications that you might not expect it to. What? No thing? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, I just was laughing at how you said that's what you'd find in biology class. <laughs> you'd find something less I'm, I'm saying that if, if you apply the interpretation to something you might find in biology class, you might find some interpretation that breaks it if you just look at the logical structure encoded in it. Right. And that's the nature of the field. It can't be as precise as math. It's the way it is. So there's too much variability? Huh? There's too much variability? Not variability. There's too much vagueness. Does there have to be vagueness, though? Or is it just... Because yeah, because vagueness? you can't have a perfect definition, for example, what an animal is. If I'm going to say this over here is an animal and this over here is a plant, there's always going to be things that are questionable. And that you get a bunch of biologists together and have them argue about it. 50% of them are going to say that should be a plant. 50% are going to say it's an animal. Why is it going to come down like that? Because our definitions aren't great. A great example is life. What's life? Right. No one has a great definition for when life is. And so there's all sorts of debates, obviously, when it comes to abortion. Is that murder or is it not? Right. Because we don't have great definitions in biology. It's the nature of the field. Meaning it's possible to and we just haven't created them? Well, it's possible to get more and more precise definitions, but as you remember, something else you want to do is uh, you want to be useful. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about all the corner cases that might come up with this definition that I'm talking about, and I'm saying it has to have this and 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 this, and if I get too crazy with it, and I make it work for every single thing that I'm thinking about, then something new might come along, and I made my definition so restrictive that now we can't include that. And so, I mean, you can always have a perfectly precise definition. Yeah, you can just find out, list all these. There's a finite number of species. There's a finite number of living organisms on this planet. I can find out, put all of them into one, all of them into the other, and be done with it. And say, what's the definition of animal? It's, all it's this or this or this or this, and just <laughs> list out my 2,564 lists of whatever it is. It's just not very useful. And then you can't teach anyone what an animal is. You have to just memorize some massive set. So, yeah, it's possible, but then the field loses its usefulness. Mm -hmm. Anyways. We were defining the term. That's what we were doing. It's going to be a long year. Why? Because it hurts. Alright, let's see. So, this works if and only if S has no free variables, which makes sense, especially if you look at one over there. We're saying S only has free variables that are used on the left-hand side. No free variables are used on the left-hand side, so S has all the free variables used, can only use free variables on the left-hand side. There aren't any. So S has no free variables, still basically follows the same restriction 1. Because those are constants? No. V1 through Vn are variables. Mm -hmm. But C is a new constant we're defining in terms of W, an existing constant. So you're defining a constant in terms of a constant. Well, we're saying C equals W is logically equivalent to some formula. We'll see an example here. Uh, no, give an example. In the next section, we introduce rules for defining operator symbols, blah, 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 blah. Why would they give an example of this? Uh... Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I thought Should be fair. This is very cool. So let's just call it. Now let's reshape this. I should have my sent my book's cutting off right in the middle of my sentence. Okay, so a new constant equals a variable. So S only uses this variable in it. So C is equal to V, 
is logically equivalent to some formula S, where S is only allowed to use this as a free variable. So let's give an example of that real quick for uh, the number one. We might come up with a definition for the number one. One is equal to y. That happens when, what would we define one to be? We say when for all x, x times y is equal to x. If this is the case, then we'll now call that thing one. Mm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. And do we call that a constant? Or if you don't want to like cheat using our existing axioms, maybe we just want to find two. Two is equal to y if and only if y is equal to one plus one. There's another function. Okay, so let's keep going there. So restriction one, s has no free variables other than v, the one used. Restriction two, s is a formula in which the only non-logical constants are primitive symbols and previously defined symbols. We're not using anything we haven't defined, or that logic doesn't automatically give us, or that our axioms don't automatically give us. Three, the formula, the formula there exists a unique V such that S is provable. So this has to be one and only one term. There has to be one and only one Y that satisfies this in order for me to call that Y1. For example, no, let's say I try to do something like this. Let square, so pretend that we're defining a new constant, let square equal y be logically equivalent to y is greater than 3. You know that number that's greater than 3? Let's call that square. Doesn't make sense, because there's multiple numbers greater than 3. So there isn't one and only one thing that makes this true. Right. So this is an avowed definition for square. There is, we would have to prove it. But we have to prove that there's one and only one y that makes this true, therefore we'll call that y1. We know that there's one and only one y that makes this true, therefore we'll call that y2. There is not one and only one y that makes this true, so we can't say square equals that y, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Make sense with that restriction saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay, so. Don't have them all written up there, but those are your rules for uh, the precise definitions in uh, logic, depending on what you're defining, a term, a relation, or a constant. And then section four, uh, the author goes over, you can also use equal signs to define uh, you can also sometimes use equal signs. Like I could have also, instead of writing this, I could have said 2 equal 1 plus 1. That's a perfectly valid definition for 2. And the one I've already said a hundred times, but now the author explicitly said it. I could define x minus y as x plus negative y. They would just have the same restrictions, but we switch. Well, Kind of the same restrictions. Let's just go over his restrictions for when we use an equals instead. Why does it get the rule for? Definitions which are identities in the last section, da 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 da, we want to consider from. Oh, we only defined it for constants and uh, operation symbols. And let's see, he's probably going to say. Now turn to formal rules. In the case of identities, which are used as definitions, we call the left side of the identity the dependium, and the right side the dependium. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. As would be expected, da da da. Of course, I need to. 
Uh-oh. So when we were defining our uh, some new formula over here, we required it to be an atomic formula, right? Well, you talked about when you're defining operations using identities, and you use what he's calling atomic terms. An atomic term is a term which has at most one operation symbol. So now rather than talking about defining operations and defining constants, we're just going to talk about defining terms. Because this is a term, and this is a term. X minus Y, that's just a term. One, that's just a term. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So now he's going to give our definition for defining terms. He says when you define a term, you define an uh, atomic term, so it has at most one operation symbol. So this defines both how we use operations and how we do constants. Make sense? So here's the rules for defining operation symbols. And terms. I don't know why it just says operation symbols. Okay, so an identity D introducing an M place operation symbol O is a proper definition in the theory of D if and only if it has the form. So it's proper definition only if it has a form O, V1, V2, dot, 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 Vn, some n place operation symbol equal to some term T. So that is a proper definition if and only if. One, all of them are distinct variables, same as before. Two, the term T has no free variables other than V1, V2, V3, all the way to Vn which is the same as what we have over there. V3, the only non-logical constants in the term T are primitive symbols and previously defined symbols. Okay, so that's the exact same. And then there was that fourth criterion. You already go over this. Uh, you don't have the fourth criteria when you do it as an equals because identity is already talking about a unique thing. So this is oh, right. it this is showing how equal to w, which is normally this is showing basically how you can define operation symbols and new constants in terms of identity right. rather than logical equivalences. Right. You can always just use logical equivalences. You don't have to use identities. Identities are obviously nice for for math. That's for math. Stuff. Yeah, for defining things like two, three, yeah, minus plus. It is worth remarking that when identities are used to define operation symbols, no justifying theorem is needed to guarantee that the operation symbol is well defined. For the formula, there exists a unique W such that T equals W is the truth of logic. So you're saying don't need to show that there's one and only one T, and the author's saying that there exists one and only one V such that V is equal to T is trivially true in logic. Replacing this side. Yeah. yeah. So he's saying there's no point in that. And that's why you drop the fourth one with identities. And then he says exactly what we're used to saying. Now we can define the numbers the way we want to, i.e. 2 can now be 1 plus 1. 3 can now be 2 plus 1, 4 can now be 3 plus 1, etc. Okay. And then here's where we get the problem dividing by 0. So that's the next section that he's going to talk about, dividing by 0. So let's have that conversation. Why can't we divide by 0? So there's a natural way that we want to do it. Let's go back and do the subtraction, because that's a good uh, pattern to follow. X minus Y is equal to Z if and only if. Uh, what is it? X is equal to Y plus Z. 
So you might be tempted to say x divided by y is equal to z if and only if x is equal to y times z, y times z right? And that seems like the natural counterpart to it, and you'll notice it works a lot of the time. Uh, for example, is 8 divided by 2 equal to 4? Well, I don't know. Let's check over here. Is 8 equal to 2 times 4? Yeah. yeah, 8 is equal to 2 times 4. Okay, so 8 divided by 2 equals 4. So this worked almost every time. Where it obviously doesn't work is 0. When y is equal to 0. So if I have x, I'm going to do my fraction this way. Everyone okay with that? Yes. x divided by 0 equal to z is logically equivalent to x is equal to 0 times z. Right. Now we already have a theorem that, or we developed a theorem last time, that anything times 0 is 0. zero. So it leads to a logical contradiction. I could derive things that aren't true. It breaks one of our criteria. Right, because you make one equal to zero this way. Right, I can make one equal to zero. I can say then, one divided by zero equals, well, let's see how we can say it. The real problem is I can't do something like what's 5 divided by 0 equal to? Well, let's see how I want to say this. You need a number times 0 equals 5. Well, I, want it, I have to have my divide make sense. So this has to equal something x. Let's call it something different. Let's call it a. It's a particular term a. So what's a? If I know that 5 divided by 0 is equal to a, or we'll just say b divided by 0 is equal to a, b divided by 0 is equal to a, well, if this were our definition, then this would imply that what? b is equal to a times 0. So the only way our divided by 0 definition works is if we force the numerator to be 0. But uh, that kind of doesn't work then, because then what can A be? Anything. Anything. So I can have 0 divided by 0 equals anything. anything. Doesn't matter what you put in there. X. And it allows me to make this equal to anything. This isn't one and only one thing. This isn't talking about a particular number. So even 0 divided by 0 is not fine. Yeah, anything divided by 0 doesn't work including 0 divided by 0. And a common way to see why that doesn't work is you can make it equal to anything you want. There's some intuition for how you do it. A graphical way to often see this is to think about some line. Let's just look at a nice simple line. That goes to the origin. And what's this line equal to? It's y, y equals mx plus or in this case, it's just y equals x, right? Right. Now, the slope of this line is 1. 1. So mx plus 0. y equals mx plus b, right? Mm -hmm. So the slope everywhere on this line is 1. Or in other words, y over x is equal to 1 everywhere on this line. Mm -hmm. So that means here, y over x is equal to 1. Here y over x is equal to 1. Here y over x is equal to 1. Here, at the origin, y over x is equal to 1. So 0 divided by 0 is 1. But notice that if I were to suddenly do this, plus the equation of this line, something like y is equal to 10x plus 0, okay. then the slope everywhere is 10. So I know 10 is equal to y over x. So 0 divided by 0. So that's true everywhere along this line, including a 0. So 0 over 0 is now equal to 10. Pick any number you want, and I can make that 
if we allow anything, if we allow zero over zero to be defined, then I can make it whatever you want. So is that point on all lines just not there? Is that point on all lines just I, not there? I'm a little confused now because now. <laughs> If it's yeah, not zero over zero is a little bit weird. You have to be careful. So the author goes through all this crazy conversation about, well, uh, some people like to define it this way, and here's a good argument for defining it this way, and here's a good argument for not defining it that way. And he goes over like five different ways of thinking about it. Right. Now, you don't define division by zero. You don't do it, period. No system that defines division by zero is a good system. Bad. It's undefined. You, if you allow, if I take five anything, if I take b divided by zero and allow it to equal anything, then you can equal anything. Then yeah, I can make it equal anything else. Mm -hmm. I can make it equal two of that, three of that, half of that, ten times that, anything you want. Yep. Right. So. Yeah, this whole conversation, trying to come up with a way to cleverly handle division by zero, it doesn't work. It's not talking about one and only one number. There's either no numbers that satisfy the relationship, or there's infinitely many numbers that satisfy the relationship. Mm -hmm. In either case, it's not one and only one. And the definition needs to be talking about a particular thing. That's what a definition does. It names something. Or at least a definition when it's using an operation. It needs to name one and only one term. Okay, so he goes through a bunch of crazy conversation that you can go through and you can read it if you're interested. I think he gives literally five different ways to look at defining division by zero. No, we don't define that as the end by the end. Huh? Says in the end, actually, we can't do it, so those five ways are garbage. No, the one he ends with isn't even, we don't define it. It's just. Whatever you do with division by zero after this point in the book, it's mute because now we're going to set there. We're not building up uh, some sort of analysis here, algebra here, in this class. So this is the last so time we have to talk why about. Why does he do that? Numbers. Because he's, I'm sure he's a smart enough person to know that you can't. You know, I wondered for a while why he did it. I, I, I don't have a good answer. I don't know when it. Finally came through the mathematical community that, no, you know what, zero divided by zero, we're done with that. That's not defined. We're not going to define it as anything. It's like some places still want to define zero to the power of zero as one. In fact, if you go plug that into a calculator, a lot of your calculators will spit out one. Right. If you go plug that into Google, it will probably spit out one. It's not defined. And you can see some good reasons for why it shouldn't be defined, just intuitively. Anything to the power of zero is equal to one. Zero to the power of anything is equal to zero. Okie dokie. Maybe I should have used an x to seven a since it looks a lot different from zero. X to the zero, we make that one. Zero to the x, we make that zero. But then when you get to the zero to the zero, you just pick this one. <laughs> and uh, they're higher level arguments, but you can do, you can come up with similar intuitive things that tell you, no, no, that's broken to try and do that. And you know, that's still one that uh, this is used a lot of the time. Even though it's not defined. Well, if, if you define this to be one, okay, you define it to be one, but then there's going to come some, some things are going to come up that you say, oh, that doesn't work, that's broken. And that's the reality of defining this to be one. So really, it's just undefined. It's better to say, no, that's undefined. Well, better. I say it's better. And maybe, maybe there's some rationale that this author has. Maybe, I mean, who knows? We're talking about almost 60 years ago now. So, math progresses. How far has it progressed in 60 years? How far has it progressed in 60 years? See, the problem with that question is I don't even know all the math that there was 60 years ago. Right. 
So I can tell you how it's progressed. I mean, he's just getting all the math down for general relativity. It's insane. So yeah, I, I can't answer that question. I wish I could. <laughs> but there's someone who can, somewhere. Maybe, you so, know, more so. and more. I mean, I feel like there's people who get a high level education in mathematics. They have to realize that, oh, 60 years ago, here's some things we didn't know and now we know them, even if I don't understand them completely. Yeah, that's a, yeah, so math is just, shoots out, there's so many different fields, so many specializations. People constantly adding to it. I don't know if there's people who keep up with it all. I would guess that there's not. Seems kind of pointless. Well, obviously, I have no clue. Like, why would you even do that? What's the point? Keep up with all the body knowledge. Yeah. Well, that used to be a thing that you could do. Yeah, but I mean, once it's this big, and you just spend all day, every day, not even learning it all, just recognizing that it exists. Oh, I meant learning it all. I don't know what recognizing did, it is. Did we decide that that was impossible last year? Well, I, I mean, I said uh, knowing all the math. I didn't mean knowing everything that can be proven. I meant knowing the cutting edge and everything. Because there's a huge difference between uh, discovering a new theorem and understanding a new theorem. Right? How long did it take someone to go and finally learn the Pythagorean theorem? Who knows? How long did it take me to teach the Pythagorean theorem? Two minutes. Mm -hmm. So, it, it might be possible for someone to actually keep up with the state of the art of the game. using that expression of where math is currently at. It might, I, I have no clue. You were saying last year that here's how many people every year are given the doctorate to math, and each one of them have a dissertation. So even if you started today and you knew all math, within a year you would be able to give up that. That is my guess. Because dissertations are absolutely massive. So I have no clue how many, how many math majors are pushing out PhDs each year. But those things are thick books. And so if that number is over 365, then yeah, I cannot keep it up with it. There's no way. Assuming no that you can go through an entire dissertation in a day. In a day. Let's say that. And then Absolutely remember. insane you can get through a dissertation a day. And once you get more than 365 people doing it a year, you can no longer keep up. I don't know if that's the case. But it's not a bad assumption. I, right, I, I, I would guess. Worldwide, you graduate over 365 PhDs a year. I would guess, but who knows? There might be some sort of insane intelligence out there that just uh, can do it. Can do it. That's some mortal intelligence. I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it was Gauss. His teacher was having a hard time teaching him when he was like 11, coming up with new things for him. So he went and found some really advanced textbook that thoroughly developed arithmetic, gave it to him, very dense book, big 800 page book. Gauss comes back after six days and says, yeah, that was fun. He's fine. People like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? So there might be some insane intelligence out there that just a breeze for them, they can keep up with that, no problem. Maybe they don't even have to read the page, maybe like they can just get the flow like, oh, I see where he's going with this, yeah, 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 you're still working on it, yeah, you're getting there. Okay, you finally got there. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, you know? I mean, you kind of do that on a small level. Small level, really small level sometimes. Right, so. I can see where the proof is going. Either. Well, I'm saying you can watch some kid working on a problem and you yeah. see you know exactly where that's oh, going. Oh yeah, but that's not fair because we already did that a bunch of times over and over and over and over and over. But you you did it a bunch of times over and over and over, but remember, doing it a bunch of times didn't mean you knew where they were going. You did it a bunch of times, which led to you thoroughly understanding the process so you knew where it was going. Exactly. Maybe there's some people that go through it once and they thoroughly understand the process. Maybe there's some people where they thoroughly go through it at one place and then they realize, oh, this is just an abstraction of this and this and this, and all these are really the same. And so I don't even have to bother with these other nine fields of math. Because it's really just doing the same thing over here, and I was just able to generalize. That's it's like just because you went and added the numbers between 0 and 100, now you might be able to add the numbers between 100 and 1, 200 just fine. And you don't really need to think about it, you just come up with your abstraction, and you just apply it. 
Now, obviously, we're using really dumbed down simplified examples, but for some really complex stuff, who knows? I mean, smart people do smart things. And I, if there was one guy I worked with, and anytime he would explain something to me, it was just amazing. Like, I would go, because what, the things I was asking questions about were standard, they were standard questions that were just coming up in the textbook. They were these obscure questions. Like, I, I go off, look at something, look at something, get into the depths of something, and come across a weird concept. So then I come to him, I ask him the question. Is he a teacher? Yeah, he's a teacher at Dixie. His name's Estelle. So I ask him a question, and he's just like, whoa, I haven't had to think about that in 15 years, but, and then just explains it to me like he just finished reading it out of the textbook. He just pulls it up like there's no problem. It's like, dude, how does your brain do that? And it's not like it's something that he spends all his time studying. It's just he went over it once. He understood it when he went over it. Now, if he ever has to pull it out, there it is. All pristine, ready to go. It's insane. It makes no sense to me that he can do that, but here we are. And he doesn't think he's that bright of a guy. He's probably come across people that are like, them to him is like him to me. <laughs> and who knows where it ends. So maybe there's that something else. That makes me feel a whole lot dumber, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not special, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, I was coming across some, I, I, I can't remember how exactly they did the study, but basically they were saying, uh, how many people on average do you have to go through to get like a real genius level mathematician? Right. So recognizable names that come up in history. How many people do you have to have that are on that level that, yeah, they're going to go down in history? And the number they came out with is you'll get three in a million people. That are just on a genius level. That are just on that insane level that their brain is at the point where they can go down in history as a great mathematician. They say the number is roughly three in a million. That seems way more common than we see today, for some reason. Well, than we see today. Because today, it's all up here now. But it's as it was developing. So the point is, these great minds, if it was three in every million people were at this level, then that means that there's 900 people at that level alive in America today. Right. Which is just insane. Which is insane. Absolutely insane, yeah. So you got 900 Archimedes walking around America right now. <laughs> what are they doing with their lives? <laughs> They're pushing forward the pill. <laughs> They're doing crazy things. Who knows what they do? I mean, if you look at some of the questions that they ask just at like a, I can't remember what they're called, but like the high school level competitions are just math competitions. Math Olympiads. Type stuff, I, I'm not sure if that's the name, but maybe it is. I was just looking at some of the questions that they have those kids do, high school level kids. And oh my gosh, some of them are just absolutely insane. It's like, they have, I don't know how long they have to do the test, but it's like, those are questions that it would take me days of thinking about to come up with a solution to. These kids, it's just one of the problems that was on their test that they're doing in this competition just in the day. It's like, they're high school kids. I, I have a degree in that. They're high school kids. It's insane. And that's way more than 900, so. Yeah, there's a lot of really smart people out there pushing things forward. That's why math is such a great field. It's depressing. Why is that depressing? Because it's like, now what? I mean, where am I going to go? What, what am I going to do? That's such a guarantee <laughs> that I can spend my life learning as much as I want, and I'm never going to get stuck. Well, that's not the problem. What's the problem? The problem is my contribution is never going to be significant. Your contribution is never going to be significant. You're not going to be Archimedes. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, you're just a person. Right. You just live a life, and your life has contributions, and yeah. you have real-world applications. Well, it's something that we all, everyone has to deal with. It's just frustrating. Well, no, I'm saying, so you go and you learn the math, and you become a programmer who works on developing some software that helps some people out there. Yeah. I mean, the world's becoming a more and more convenient place. We're constantly utilizing the efforts of other people. A lot of people doing a lot of small things adds up. So... Yeah, you won't make this big mark on the world that everyone's like, oh yeah, Levi did that. Well. <laughs> but it's not hard to make the world a better place for your being here, contribute more to your society than you take from it. Right. Pretty simple. And it's better. 
and lots of other. Yeah. So, you know how to make society a better place. And you can progress as much as you want to. And there's going to be no hiccup. Nothing in your way. That's not true exactly, though. Because what, what happens if you just can't understand it? As much as you're willing to. I don't know if there comes a point. Well, I should say that. That, that is a fundamental limitation. I don't know if you could have understood. Well, it's just you, you stopped. You reached the level sentence, of your comprehension. And I can find the sentence in my computation theory book. And it took me a half hour to comprehend the sentence. One sentence. Same. I can show it to you. Well, why would they write sentences like that? That was my first critique. Because, you know, I'm going through this and I'm... You just get angry, you're infuriated. This stupid author. Why is he going from this, jumping to here, and forcing me to do all this in one sentence? This is way too complicated. He needs to break this down into baby steps for me and spoon feed it to me and work up to this idea. So I was really infuriated at this author, and then when I finally understood it, I thought, how could you re say that? <laughs> and I couldn't think about a better way to say it because I also had a friend who was taking a class with me, and he had the same problem. And I spent a half hour trying to explain it to him, kind of with all these wild ways to try and, and I can't do it. He didn't understand the sentence. And you watched it from that point in the book, like 95% of the class just checked out. You know that at that point in the book, they couldn't get past it. And when you understand it, it's like, no. I didn't know how else to say it. So, <laughs> hey, that, I have in discrete math. Yeah. Well, not 95% of the class dropped out, but there'd just be something you'd say that I just didn't get at all, and you'd say it over and over and explain it in tons of different ways, and then it would click, and then be like, well, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, you'll have those moments all the time. All the time. Yeah. But, I mean, a half hour, I was infuriated when I was reading that. I remember, I was so remember doing the probability, <laughs> and you were teaching random variables, and I sat there for an hour while you tried to explain to me random variables. And then a week later, I was fine. <laughs> a random variable is a function that spits out a real number. It's not random, and it's not a variable. <laughs> That's all it is. It's a function. You put something in there, doesn't matter what the domain is, it just spits out a real number. You think that'd be simple, would you? You think it'd be simple. There you go. A random variable. It took Ignore me. the name. It's just a function that spits out a real number. Why did it take me so long to understand? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Well, the domain, I think, has to be a sample, be the sample space, so. Well, it doesn't matter, I understood that. But, yeah, it's not a hard problem. Is this the screen now? Yeah. That's when you get into <laughs> probability. No, it's when you feel like you get for no reason. <laughs> well, to be fair, he slept through half the class. That's not even true. <laughs> All right, two thirds. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't really fall asleep. It just I didn't really fall asleep. I would doze sometimes because when you're up till two o'clock doing homework, you're tired. <laughs> All right, but anyways, yeah, we covered everything that we need to for definitions. So next time we'll start sets. Uh, I don't know. I guess we can start sets right now. We won't go in, I'll, I'll cover all the sections next time, so I won't go into sections, but I'll just start with like a high level overview of sets. What is there to go over besides notation? Is there anything to go over besides just notation? Here's what it's out looks like. Uh, notation, operation, uh, defining it in terms of logic. Showing sets of equivalent. Oh, so everything you do in discrete math. I mean, it's a chapter in discrete math, sets. It's not a whole chapter, it's a section. Oh, there's two sections or two chapters? It's not, it's not a whole chapter. No way. It's it a is, lot to go over. Is it seriously an entire chapter? Yeah, that's. I could be wrong. Oh no, collections. Collections is a section. Here. Then there's a 
there's only two sections in there. But then we didn't go over partially ordered sets, which is a whole chapter in and of itself. Right, but you said we're going to have to do Well, in this, in this we won't get that today. We'll just do a high level overview of sets real quick and some of their operations. So now we're doing reset, reset, reset all the way back, back to the very beginning. And collections didn't even go over. Collections it included way more than just sets. Yeah, I'm guessing that list from collections, factorial. And then well, that's had, just counting collections. You had, um, you had one section on sets, and and it was your introduction to what a subset, and then operations. That's it. So two sections. Yeah. All right, a set. So. Sets, going back, we can't define what a set is, obviously. It has to be one of those undefined terms. Everything comes back to being defined in terms of sets. When we talk about any mathematical object, it's really just a set somehow. That's all it is. And so what is a set? A set, the terminology I like to use, it's terminology that's used in uh, computer uh, science, is a set is an unordered, unique collection of objects. You can put anything you want in a set. The order doesn't matter, and repeats don't matter. So for example, square, star, 17, 91, square is equal to the set, star, 17, 17, 17, square, 91. Notice every object that's in this set is in this set, and every object that's in this set is in this set, therefore those sets are equal. The order doesn't matter, and repeats don't matter. Unordered, unique collection. Unique meaning there's only one of each thing in there, so putting duplicates in doesn't change anything, there's still only one. So question, how big is this set? How many eyes are in there? Four. Five. Five, right? No, four. So how many are in here? Four. Four, because they're in the same set. You couldn't have two, four, six things in here and five things in there and have them be the same set. That doesn't make any sense. So a set, unordered, unique collection of objects. And we have some basic operations that we can perform on sets. Uh, let's write out two sets really quick. I'll do set A is equal to one, two, three. And I'll do set B is equal to three, four, five. So the two basic operations on sets are union and intersection. And you've seen all this before. This comes up in math 101 times, but we'll go over here. So A union B is equal to the set of all objects such that the set of all X, where X is in A, or x is in b. Similarly, a intersect b is equal to the set of all objects such that x is in a and x is in b. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. So let's write it out. For these specific sets, sorry, let's call these C and D. This is, this is for any two sets in general. Now let's write out what C union D is and what C intersect D is. So C union D is equal to every X that's in A or in B. So let's check our X's. Is one in is 1 in C or D? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So this statement, if X is 1, 1 is in C or 1 is in D, is true. So it's included. So 1's in there. What about 2? Mm -hmm. What about square? No. What about star? No. What about 3? Mm -hmm. What about 4? Yes. What about 7? No. What about 5? And you'll notice if we continue naming every object in the universe, no other ones would be in there. These five objects are the only things that are in C or D. Right. So C union D is the set of every object 
That's in either the first set or in the second set. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Intersection, same thing, except for and instead of or. So the set of everything that's in C and D, and the only thing that's in both of those is three. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now the way that you prove that two sets are equal is to show that everything in one set's in the other and everything that's in the other is in the one. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. If everything that's in here is in here, mm -hmm. oh, maybe we should talk about subsets real quick. So that's union intersection, now let's talk about subsets. So A is a subset of B if and only if we're doing a definition for subset here. Just like this was a definition, this was a definition. Mm -hmm. So first off, notice that these are operations. Yeah. That's an important thing to know. This is taking two sets and spitting out a set. This is taking two sets and spitting out a set. Right. So it's an operation on sets, just like plus is an operation on numbers. It takes two numbers and it spits out a number. It takes two sets and spits out a set. Okay. So A is a subset of B. This is not an operation. This is a relation. And A is a subset of B if and only if for all X in A, X is in B. If every X in A is also in B, then A is a subset of B. Mm -hmm. So... Let's see, is this statement true or false? It's true. Is a set 1, 2 a subset of 1, 2, 3? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because everything in there is in there. All right, let's change it. Is a set 1, 2 a subset of 1, 2? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. That's not smaller. That's okay. That's okay. Right? Everything in A is in B. Everything in here is in here. Right. Make sense? What about this one? An empty set. Nothing's in there. Is this a subset of this? No. Obviously not. Right? Because not everything in here is in here. There's tons of things in here, not in here. Name one thing in here that's not in here. Oh, there's nothing? <laughs> so everything in here is in there? This is a subset of this. Okay. Yeah. If it's in here, then it's in here. <laughs> Every time. Okay. <laughs> it's not false, so that's a subset. Maybe that will help you. A is a subset of B, if and only if, for every X in A, X is in B. Or in other words, here's another way that we can write this. How, if there's nothing in X a, being in A implies X is in B. And if X in A is always false, this statement is always true. 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 Everything in here is in here. Take, list every object in existence and ask the question, if it's in here, is it also in here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Everything in here is in here. There's nothing in here that's not in here. Good? And we have a special notation for this. We use that symbol. That's our symbol for the empty set, a circle with a line through it. So two statements to help make sure that you understand all these. Let's just write out some trivial statements. A intersect the empty set is equal to? A. A, right? Let's spell A weird. The empty set. What's everything that's in A and in the empty set? Nothing. Nothing. This is a set of everything that's in both those. Why, why are you saying that's how you spell A weird? 
<laughs> because A is the wrong answer. <laughs> okay, I thought they were all Chinese. <laughs> no, I was making fun of Levi. Yeah, I needed it. <laughs> so, what's in both A and the empty set? Nothing. The empty set. This contains everything that's in both those. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. All right, let's look at another one. The empty set union A. Is A. What's well, everything that's in there or in there? Everything. Just the stuff in there, since there's nothing in here. Right. Mm -hmm. Alright? Uh, true or false? True. True. We, we just did that. For any A? True. Not for a particular A, I'm saying in general. Is this always true? Yes. 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 What about this? Oh yeah, the minus. Yeah. So that's the union intersection. Now we also have define a new symbol. Set of subtraction or complement. Are yeah, are we doing complement? This author doesn't like this. Well, subtraction and complement are really the same thing. It's just you define the right hand side to be some universe of objects. What's the complement of A? Everything that's not in A. In some universe. In the universe, right. So take the set that is your universe, minus A. So same thing as A really the same thing. But are you going to show us both notations today? Well, here's a notation that the author uses for set subtraction. I don't know if complements ever can come up. If it comes up, I'll go over it. But you, you don't want to go over it just because? It, it kind of doesn't make sense unless there's a universe of objects that you're going to keep referencing. So A minus B, what is that? That's equal to the set of all X such that X is in A and X is not in B. New symbol. Not in B. Or in other words, you take everything that's in A, get rid of everything that's in B. Take A, remove all the elements that are also in B, that's A minus B. So let's do C minus D real quick, and what is it? If we do C minus D, what set do we get? One, two, four, five. One, two, four, five, right? Isn't that four and five, Mark? Yeah. Oh, my bad. Oh, yeah, just one and two. Just one and two. Good job. Just to set one, two. Isn't there, yeah. was there a, another symbol or one? Was it just using the Yeah, uh, what do they call it? The symmetric difference or something like that? Yeah. No. It wasn't like a. Uh, it was a delta. Truck a delta. Yeah. Uh, so there's A minus D. I think that those are all the symbols that he introduces. Some symbols that you may come across in other books. Well, then I'd have to introduce a complement. Now, I'm probably just going to use set subtraction like this. That's the way I'm used to doing it, and it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. C minus D, everything in here, that's not last one here. That's not the same subtraction that we talked about in the integers, that's a set operation. But once again, it's an operation, takes two sets, spits out a set. Acts just like an operation does. Oh, uh, we have another symbol. So this is this is subset, and the, the counterpart that we often think about is it's kind of like less than or equals. It's either all the elements that are in there or some smaller amount of the elements that are in there. Kind of like less than or equals. Mm -hmm. You see that? And then we have another symbol called a proper subset. So let's write it out over here. I guess we didn't write subset over here, but we'll do proper subset. A is a proper subset of B if and only if A is a subset of B and A is not equal to B. Then we call it a proper subset. So it can't be the same, it has to in some sense be smaller than this. But also everything in here is also in there. So it's a subset but smaller, not the same. 
Okay, any of those seem weird? Any questions about any of those? So that's high level what a set is. Those are the basic operations that we perform on sets over and over again. Uh, hopefully this author will have us go over some basic proofs with them because there's a lot of uh, similarities between how we operate sets and how we operate uh, with logic symbols. Are, is, is the way that you define it different than the way the author defines it? For what? Sets. My definition of a set? Yeah. I didn't get a definition of a set. You, you did. Well, I told you how we talk about computer science, but it's just something that you have to get comfortable with what it is. It's an un Fundamentally, this is like the, the most fundamental thing in all of math is a set. I mean, if anything's undefined in math, a set is undefined in math. It's what we build everything else out of. But it isn't what you what you gave a pretty good intuition. How does the author do it differently? I don't know how the author does it, but that's how I've always thought about an unordered, unique collection of objects. How is that? Why is that not a definition? Well, so first off, we're using the word unordered, right? Mm -hmm. But in order to say it's unordered, we first need a definition of order, and we create a definition of order from the set. Well, doesn't, but the point is we have some basic things and we work our way up to what order means. Right. Which is more like... So I can't start out with unordered as something that I use to define a set. Because then we have to have order defined. And how am I going to define order without a set? Right. Doesn't work. So because it's circular. It, it would have to be circular, yeah. And then what's a collection going to be? If I'm going to define set in terms of collection, then what's a collection? Is collection going to be my unordered term or my undefined term? Or in my coming back around talking about collection, am I going to say it's a set? So, I mean, there's just no way to come to terms with the terms you want to use when you say it's an unordered and once again unique collection. So, we'll eventually get to an order. So, for example, I guess we could do that one real quick. I don't know if this author will do it. But, uh, an ordered collection that you're used to seeing is something like an ordered pair. One comma two. One comma two, you're used to seeing that for representing like a point. And order matters in that context very much. One comma two is not the same thing as a point two comma one. Those are talking about very different points. Mm -hmm. One comma two, we typically think about as representing this point two comma one, we typically think about representing that point. So those are not the same. Furthermore, that is also not equal to one comma one comma two, where that's some three-dimensional point, is one interpretation of it. So these would be order collections, and we have to define these in terms of sets. So if we're like one, two, how do we define that in terms of set? One, two, if we were to write that in sets, is a set one, one, two. And that's how we define that in terms of set. So we use a set definition to come up with some notion of what order is here. Mm -hmm. And so this is really just shorthand for that. And then obviously, one is shorthand for the set containing the, the empty set. Two is shorthand for the set containing one and the empty set. Did we already talk about that briefly? Yeah, but it yeah, still doesn't make a lot of sense. That zero we define to be the empty set. You're right, I get that we define it to be that. It just still doesn't make sense why. Well, it's more fundamental than zero. Well, why do we define one to be the set containing the empty set? Uh, because of how we define our plus one function. So with Pino's axioms, you basically start with a zero and right. the notion just, of what plus one is. I know, it just doesn't make a lot of zero sense. It's just a set of a bunch of empty sets, like nested empty sets. That's what the minutes of those numbers are. It's, that's what every mathematical object is. It's just sets. Okay. Sets, 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 all so it that is. It just doesn't make sense to me. Fill out the sets. Real world concepts. Remember, that's an interpretation. You're taking some abstraction, you're applying an interpretation to it because you think it's useful in the world. Mm -hmm. So you take some abstraction, apply the interpretation. The abstraction then tells you, using its theorems, if you interpret my axioms this way, you have to interpret this conclusion this way. 
And you go and you say that conclusion works in the real world. So how would, how do you represent even simple operations like three minus two which makes sense? Because if three well, is you defined, would never <laughs> if you know if two is defined to be the set between one and the empty set. You would never write that out with just sets because that's going to turn into a nightmare. Right. Which is why we have so much shorthand. Right. So like is it possible to do it that way though? Yeah, because we can have everything defined. So I can have zero this way. I can have one defined as the set. Well, then I can define some sort of plus function. Now, we haven't talked about what a function is, but okay, let's pretend that we have some function. Okay. And so my plus function is really going to be my increment function, adds one to my function. It incremented on a, what does it give you? It gives you, what is it? A union with the set containing a. So there's my successor function or increment function or whatever you want to think about it. So then I define one to be increment of zero, which is going to be the empty set union with the set containing the empty set, which in this case is just equal to the set containing the empty set, which is equal to the set containing zero. And if I define two to be that on one, it's going to come out to be the set containing zero and one. And I could continue defining all my numbers like this. Right. And you can define negative numbers and rational and irrational numbers. Right. So once I have these, once I have my addition, I would need to create my multiplication in terms of my addition. So something I that we never talked about in screen math that's always kind of confused me is what exactly is a decimal in terms of this? Like if you were using set theory, how do you represent? You, you don't because you build up to it. So you build, so you construct your natural numbers, which kind of start out like this. Mm -hmm. Then you construct your integers from your natural numbers, which is basically introducing negative, the way that we already did from our axioms. Mm -hmm. And then you introduce the rationals, which is, can be encoded just like this. You can encode every rational number as just an ordered pair of integers. So. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. And how do you encode the irrationals? And then going from irrationals to the reals is a little bit more complicated. And I can't do that in 10 seconds. But it's a similar process. But there's where you have to make a pretty big jump because, well, I don't know if it's the reason why, but you're fundamentally changing the size of your set. So, uh, the size of the natural numbers, or just being the natural numbers, is there are integers, as there are rationals. Right. And going from the rationals to the reals is where you actually change the size of the set. So, but you do with all, probably how you're thinking, where you create an infinite decimal expansion by an actual infinite set of numbers. So you have to create the it, yeah, it's going to be infinite. So one, when we're developing our real numbers, is one like that. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and that is one approach that what we're doing for calculus uh, sometimes does. People take the time to do all that, but the problem is, is that it takes like six weeks of their class to finally get started working your way up to the real numbers and then finally get going. And I don't like that. Probably just about the recording a while ago. None of this is relevant to the actual class. Mm -hmm.